Okay. Well, I say let's get going because I am, I am so excited to introduce tonight's presenter to you. Um, but first, I, I would like to welcome you to the first ever GIS After Dark. Um, this is a speaker series that we have designed to bring together GIS professionals um, from inside JHU and also from outside. So GIS professionals from all different capacities. Um, my name is Dr. Cassandra Hansen. I'm the program coordinator for GIS and environmental science and policy. And again, you know, we created this speaker series to um, have an opportunity for you guys to hear innovative ideas and techniques and projects from all different disciplines across the board. It is my honor to welcome cartographic innovator Kevin McManigle here tonight. Um, I asked Kevin to share with the group his all inspiring maps that inform and help save big cats worldwide. So Kevin has intimate knowledge of modern GIS and cartographic workflow. As you will see tonight, Kevin crafts functional cartographic maps util utilizing GIS and geographic software to produce products that inform, but most importantly, inspire. Um, Kevin also has extensive travel experience, including mountaineering expeditions to Alaska and Europe and South America. And he currently teaches cartography and GIS at the University of Montana. And at this point, Kevin, I'm gonna turn over, over the presenting powers to you. Thank you so much for speaking to the group tonight. And uh, guys, enjoy and make sure you get those questions written down because uh, we're gonna have some time afterwards to ask Kevin. Okay, all right, let me go ahead and get set up here and share my screen. Do that one there and share computer sound, great. And then let me start my presentation. All right, everybody can see it, I'm hoping. If not, then let me know now or forever hold your peace. Nope, not yet. Kevin, grab, go ahead and say start sharing. I did, and it says I'm sharing. Okay, okay, there we go. Yeah, are we good? We're good. Okay, super. So um, if at any point uh, something goes wrong, you can't hear me or something, just let us know, we'll figure it out. We're doing a lot of Zoom lately, right? With teaching during the COVID era spend a lot of time in front of a computer screen instead of a class, which has its benefits, but also detracts. I really love to teach students face to face. Um, Cassie asked me here to talk about um, what I do here at the University of Montana and, and how I've been able to find a niche for my research to really uh, help me make a, make a difference in the world. So um, GIS is fantastically powerful uh, software and it's a, it's a fascinating discipline to be involved in. Um, but Sometimes, you know, we, we finish our degree or, or we're out there working for years and years doing, uh, you know, day-to-day -day GIS, maybe managing a water district's, you know, uh, data or, or working on forest polygons for the Forest Service or something. And it's all great work, but, but every once in a while, the opportunity shows up for you to take your skill set and your passion and you're in the right place at the right time with the right project, and you can really put that all together and, and actually do something that makes you feel like you've made a difference in the world. And I really, I really um, would, would recommend that everybody wait for that opportunity in your life. And when it shows up, pounce. Just be ready. And when it comes, make those hard decisions and, and do it because it, it really does add to the fulfilling uh, aspects of a life well lived. Okay, so let's get into it. This is conservation cartography, saving the big cats. We're using innovative maps, apps, anything we can to save them, because right now it's a little bit dire. This presentation is going to start with a, a couple of harsh facts that are a little painful to hear, um, but I promise you that after we go low, we're going to go high, and I'm going to leave you with some inspiration and some, some really joyous uh, uh, developments in the world of, of conservation for the big cats that um, my team, my students, and myself here at the University of Montana have been a part of. Oh, right, so cute. We love to see an image of a mama tiger and her kitten, right? But right. slowly, they're fading away. Biological diversity is messy. It walks, it crawls, it swims, swoops, it buzzes. But extinction is silent. And like those cats slowly disappeared off the screen, we're losing them from the wild today. And it has no other voice than our own. This is a problem that is 100% human made. We are living through the sixth mass extinction. 
And humans are 100% responsible for it. It's rough, we don't wanna hear it, but it's true. And we need to take action, and we need to take action now. Some of us are taking action by fighting climate change. Some are taking action by working on equality issues. And I just happen to be well-placed to take action um, for conservation of species that are going extinct. A recent study looked at the biomass for the whole planet. And what they came up with, that in the last 100 years, we've seen an absolute reversal where 96% of all the biomass of mammals on the planet is us and our livestock. And only 4% are wild animals. 100 years ago, this was exactly reversed, right? Looking back to the rise of human civilization, so I say that with air quotes, um, since 2000 years ago, we've lost 83% of the biomass of all wild animals. Not 83% of the species have gone extinct, but their overall volume on the planet has been reduced by 83%. 80% of marine mammals due to the whaling in previous centuries, right? 50% of all the plants and 15% of all the fish. This is unsustainable. We know that we cannot continue like this. Something has to give. For the big cats, it's been a particularly disturbing century. So 100 years ago, there was 100,000 wild tigers. Now we're down to about 3,900. We've lost 96% of them in a century. There was 100,000 cheetahs. Now we're down to 7,100, 93% reduction in a century. We've gone from 200,000 lions down to 20,000, only 20,000 left in the wild, a 90% reduction. And we've lost from 30,000 down to 6,000 snow leopards. And the little tilde is there because it's, it's a rough number to come to. It's hard to actually count the snow leopards. They're so secretive cats. But we've roughly lost 80% of them in the wild. But certainly the big cat that has taken the largest hit has been the tigers, right? So people might say, what's the big deal? We have tigers in zoos. Yes, we do. In fact, there are more tigers in captivity in Texas than we have alive wild in the world today. Um, well, Dr. Alan Rovanovitz, he's the founder of Panthera, said the energy on Earth with big predators is a very, very different energy. It's this huge, positive, overwhelming force which humbles you and makes you realize that there are things much greater on this earth than you. The, the top predators in any ecosystem are really what drive the health of that ecosystem. Without them, you can't have an, a healthy ecosystem. From the top predator, we have trophic cascades which go down through all the other species in an ecosystem. And they actually change not only the overall biodiversity and health of the biome, but they actually change the physical geography. Um, you might not realize, but when they reintroduced wolves to, uh, to Yellowstone here in Montana and Wyoming, it changed the course of the rivers because the wolves predated on the elk. The elk no longer stayed in the river bottoms and ate all the fresh shoots and different bush communities could grow on the riverbanks and it changed the way that the rivers flow through the park. That's how important the top predators are. Well, we have a big, beautiful planet full of terrestrial ecosystems and marine ecosystems that need to be protected. I recently had some of my students, after they went through all my advanced classes, work on a, a, a semester long thing I called the GIS Jam. And we produced this map of over 200,000 terrestrial protected areas in the world and another 20,000 marine. It's huge, it's almost the sheet of a plywood. It's like 44 by 95 inches. Beautiful big map. But it turns out that only 50% of all these terrestrial ecosystems are mapped at a scale that is adequate for management. So they're probably just a polygon drawn in a database somewhere. We have a term for this. I came up with a term called PINO. Right? Stands for park in name only. In the literature, we call these paper parks because they've been designated, but they're not protected. They might not even be mapped at the level you would need to have tourists come to them. Right? Um, this is something that I have the unique skills to change if we have the opportunity to do it. So for tigers, it's particularly troublesome. Here's Asia, and here is the tiger range 100 years ago. So tigers have lost 
almost all of their range in a century. They've gone from that huge range covering this wide expanse from the Ariel and the Caspian Sea all the way to the Yamchaka Peninsula, right, down to only 4% of their original range. There's no more range for them to move into. We talk about habitat loss as being a big driver of species extinction, but in the tiger's case, this is their last stand habitats. We can't lose any more, but if we don't stop the other biggest threat to them in the wild, which is poaching, then we won't have parks with any of the megafauna. We'll have beautiful parks full of trees and flowers and grasses and no animals, right? So we have another issue. You may have heard this, but inside this circle is where most of the wild tigers live, about 3,900 of them, right? But also 50% of the world's population lives right here in this circle. And of that 50% of the world's population, billions of people, 50% of them are in extreme poverty. And that equals about living on less than $2 a day. Now we've made progress as a human society. We've increased this, the UN used to define it as less than a dollar a day. So we've doubled their wages, but it's still not very much. Can you imagine living on less than $2 a day? It might drive you to do some unthinkable things. In geography, we have these concepts of push and pull factors, right? And if you're extremely poor, you might be being pushed to make the decision to poach a tiger and earn all that money. You're being pulled toward the black market trade. So what would you do if you made less than $600 a year? If you knew that you could get $300 to $2,000 if you went into the forest and poached a tiger? What if you had the, the means to be a middleman and get the tiger parts out of the country? You could earn anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000. What if you're a kingpin in the black market animal trade? You could earn anywhere from $50,000 to half a million dollars for a whole tiger if it makes it all the way into the Chinese medicinal market. Huge push and pull factors. Right? So what are people buying these tiger parts for? Well, in the, in the medicinal, traditional uh, herbal markets, tiger parts are really sought after because they are, um, they are used in medicinal medicines like tiger bone wine, right? Or salves, mostly for uh, male impotency. Even though scientific studies have completely proven that these things do not help with male impotency, it's very hard to change thousands of years of culture. And we've tried to raise awareness. We've tried to pay people not to poach. We've tried many different things. But with that kind of a push-pull factor and tigers being worth so much, it's extremely hard to get all the people to stop going for it and poaching, right? I've always said that if we just changed and rebranded Viagra to something like Tiagra and put little tiger stripes on the pill, somebody would be a billionaire and it would actually solve the problem and it might save the tigers. But nobody listens to my crazy ideas. Okay, so how bad is the problem? Well, a recent study said that almost one in five tigers are killed every single year by poachers, right? We're losing up to 20% of wild tigers every year in the wild due to illegal poaching. So right now, habitat destruction is literally the least of our worries. Our biggest threat, the thing we have to stop, is poaching. Enter Panthera. So a few years back, um, uh, the Panthera organization, one of the largest uh, conservation organizations for large cats in the world, uh, started the Tigers Forever program. And they had a pretty simple goal. They wanted to increase tiger population by 50% in some key Tiger Forever sites over the course of 10 years. And they also wanted to facilitate connectivity between tiger source sites and then these tiger parks who had the habitat, had all the prey that the tigers needed, but lacked the protection. And every time tigers came into those parks, they were simply being poached. So if we zoom in on this map, you can see this is actually something I just created last fall. And it's a bit of a giveaway because we're seeing some really um, raised numbers overall, right? So we've got orange is the population estimate for the park now. And then the blue would be the recovery population. And you can see like in Parsa Wildlife Reserve there in Nepal, we've got 18 tigers now. In 2014, Dr. Hugh Robinson walked into my office here at the University of Montana and said, I hear you know how to make maps. 
And I was like, well, that's the rumor going around, but my students might disagree. He said, well, I have a unique problem. I have this park, Parsa, in Nepal. It's right next to Royal Chitwan National Park that has a great tiger population. But every time tigers come across this imaginary line into Parsa, they're poached. And the rangers are getting lost in the dense jungle when they're out there trying to do patrols. Their GPSs rarely have any signal under the dense canopy of the jungle. And when they do pop out of the jungle, there's no decent base map on their GPS. And I said, well, maybe I can fix that. I'm going to try. Let's see what we can do, right? So we set to work on Parsa. We mapped that entire park. I'm going to go over that in a second. Then we moved on to Manus National Park in India, another beautiful park bordering uh, Bhutan, where there's a healthy uh, tiger population, but almost none in Manus. Then we took a quick detour. We went over to Africa and we mapped a, a park in Senegal for lions. The folks in the lion program heard about our maps. They became popular. So we went ahead and went over there. And then we came back over to Asia and we mapped the Kenya Taman Nagara Park in Malaysia for tigers again. Okay, so let's go take a look at each one of these maps and then I'll show you uh, what kind of success we've had with this program. So Rob Pickles, the lead uh, tiger program official on the ground, he's the one that trains the rangers to use our maps to stop the poaching. He's, he's got a really powerful quote here when he says, it would be a massive indictment against humanity if during our time tigers walked into extinction and we didn't prevent it. It's, it's not too little and it's not too late. Um, a lot of people uh, can get depressed about the state of affairs and just say all is lost, but it turns out that we do have the technology, we have the skill sets, and we have the money and the, the person power to stop what is causing the, the extinction of the big cats right now. So moving on to the parcel wildlife reserve, what's the first thing you want to do when you make a map? Well, you want to look for some data, right? So I just do a quick search and try and find maps of the parcel wildlife reserve. Turned out that they had had topo maps made in the past, but they were about 20 years old. They'd been photocopied again and again and again and were really hard to read. And they were a massive undertaking, usually to make topo maps that are equivalent to our USGS 7.5 topo maps that we're all used to uh, for hiking, requires the resources of a government. And that was the case in Nepal, government paired with the government of Finland and they made a set of topo maps. But like I said, they weren't too good anymore. This is the kind of map I could find online. And you know what kind of data I could find in the GIS format? None. I had the park boundary. I can easily find uh, 30 meter DEMs for the whole entire world, right? And a little bit of street network data, um, especially the major streets and some towns and villages out of, you know, open street map or so, but nothing that would let us produce maps like this. So this is a zoom of a finished topo map that we created. And what we had to do is get some satellite imagery from Digital Globe at the half meter resolution. And I had my students go through in GIS, start an editing session and digitize every single feature you see here. They did every road, they did every stream, they did every building and the temples and the schools and you name it, including the power line, right? I made the shader relief. We used um, some image classification to get our, um, our land cover, which included all the cultivation and then the forests, right? And then eventually we were able to take all that data, export it out to Illustrator, combine nice shader relief with fantastic vector type work and line work, and come up with a final product that was excellent for field use. And we even printed it on waterproof paper. An interesting story here, I had the 2015 data as far as the DigiGlobe imagery, and we actually saw in the imagery an entire little village right here. And we knew it was across the actual border of the park, but we mapped it anyways. And then when we sent the proofs to the folks in Paul digitally, they came back and said, hey, why didn't you get rid of that village? We got rid of it last spring. Those folks had actually come across the river illegally and set up an entire village, and we went and made them move all back across the river. So we went back to our maps, erased the village, put the guard post that they had installed in, right? And sent another proof of the maps out. Funny things, right? So we ended up mapping these 13 map panels. Um, we didn't even have time. They wanted the maps now. They really needed them. So we usually like to square it out and finish off the top, but we didn't have time this time. And then we sent them over to the rangers. It turned out this was right after the earthquake in Nepal. And then they had a strike and the airport in Kathmandu was closed. 
So the maps had to be smuggled through some cloak and dagger work um, in, in their map tube from India into Nepal before they could even make it to the park. But the rangers got them, they were super happy. They started planning their patrols. And I also took the maps and geo-referenced them and created base data for their GPS units. So when they did pop out of the dense jungle, they could see where they were and the map that they were holding in paper in their hands was the same as the one that was on their unit. And then of course, we felt great, right? So the local newspaper here in Missoula came and took a picture of myself and my students after the project was finished. And um, we got a little write up. Journalists always write the funniest uh, headlines. It was uh, Nepali poachers fear UM cartographers. I was like, if you're willing to go into the jungle and try and take a tiger, I don't think you're really afraid of cartographers, but you might be afraid of the edge our maps give the rangers. All right, so we had a little time off, but pretty soon word got out that the maps were good, and we got a call that they wanted us to map Manus National Park in India. So what's the first thing I did? I looked up in Manus. No good maps, no good data. So here we go again, right? So we went through the same process, digitizing everything by hand, Changed some things. We used Google Earth Engine to do our, um, our ground cover classification this time. That went much faster. And we were able to produce the maps much quicker. And this is one of the full map sheets. So this is equivalent to a 7.5 topo map. Seven and a half minutes of latitude, seven and a half minutes of longitude. I did change the scale to one to 25,000 because it's easier to work in meters instead of 24. Nobody counts in 24s, right? It's easy to count in 25s. And so we would have all of these maps would come together to cover the entire park. Here's a zoomed in version of our final uh, map set. So we went through, again, digitized every single road. We had the cultivation in the villages, a very different landscape, a very, a very defined park border between Manus National Park and then all of the villages outside the park where they had cultivation right up to the park boundary, right? We hand digitized every single one of these little um, uh, village uh, houses and so forth. One map sheet had over 18,000 clicks. So we have to find a better way to do this. It takes a long time. We'll talk about that later. All these little fish ponds on an offshoot of the river, but a different landscape too, very flat, right? Out here in the grasslands, but then sloping up into the Terai or the hills of Bhutan. So here are all the map sheets put together. Manus is in the middle. Royal Manus National Park is across the border in Bhutan, and that's the source population for tigers. Problem was, as soon as they came over in, into India, they were getting poached. And most of the poachers were coming in through the villages here to the south. So we mapped all of those so that the anti-poaching rangers had total awareness of the entire field that they were trying to protect. Well, I said, maybe I could do something cool with all this data. I, I pieced them all together and I made a KMZ so that they could put it into Google Earth. And so we have a Google Earth registered image. I thought the rangers would love this. They'll be able to zoom around, do fly throughs, project it on the wall and plan their patrols. And you know, we sent all that data over to them. They held a big training and um, the rangers received the maps. They were extremely happy. But once you let your maps out into the wild, you never know what's gonna happen. And so I had no idea that they would do this. They took our maps, they laminated them on a tabletop and they started wargaming their different patrols with these flotillas of rangers being pushed around like you would see at the Pentagon or something. Didn't expect this at all, but still happy that they were finding a use for the maps, right? And the rangers took them out in the field and that's what really counts, right? They cut them up and taped them together and folded them just like I expected they would and took them into the field and used them to get control of the landscape, right? With a focused, efficient patrolling regime that made sure that no corners of the park were left untouched. Oh, one last funny story about that one. Right as we were sending these out, there was an article that came out in the India Times where India was fining cartographers $15 million if you made a map that they didn't like, and there was the possibility of going to jail. So I quickly erased my name from all the maps and, and left the students on there. No, I would never do that. Um, we went ahead and asked permission. They looked them at, at them, and they said they're fine. But, you know, there's a little touch and go there for a second. Okay, then we took a fly over to, to Africa. Neocolocoba, it's got this great name, right? It's a park in Senegal. And they had um, a little bit of an issue, much bigger park, but they were having a lot of poaching of lions in the park. There was a gold company that wanted to make a gold, new gold mine outside of the park and had cut a deal that if they were allowed to cut just a corner of one road that gave them access to the gold mine, they would give us a bunch of money 
to try and map and stop the poaching. So I put together the grid, figured out what we would need to do, and went ahead, got a team of students together, and started the whole process over again. And this is what one of our final map sheets looked like. A totally different style um, as far as the shaded relief because this is rolling hill country with deep uh, canyons full of vegetation and then rock outcroppings of granite where the, the, the lions will sit on there in the evening and cool off and then sleep up on top of the rocks and hunt down looking at the, uh, the prey down in the vegetation early in the morning, right? Put all of those maps together again in a big beautiful um, uh, you know, geo-referenced mosaic and then, you know, did the same thing that I did with all the other products, made them available for the GPS units in Google Earth, so on and so forth. But they used these maps in a very different way. What we found is they were using them to cut roads into the park to make not only for the, the mine, but also to make new roads for the rangers to establish more camps. This park was um, a lot of, um, of driving patrols versus the walking patrols that we used to see. Right? So they used our maps and our excellent um, uh, uh, contours to, to place their roads in the field. And they went ahead and cut a few in and put a few new ranger stations. But one of the interesting features that the, the students found is as they were digitizing, they saw dozens and dozens of these salt pans. And so in the monsoon season, this fills up with water. And then slowly throughout the dry season, these are the last places to dry out. And of course, that's where animals congregate, right? To get the last bit of water. It's of course where the poachers congregate too. So in this mashup, the, the park headquarters is right here and just 10 kilometers away was a huge salt pan that they had never visited. They saw this on our maps, they drove over there, they camped out in the bush and waited and within a couple of days a team of poachers showed up and they arrested them. Right? So the maps are giving them a different look at their entire landscape, a landscape that is very close but they were unfamiliar with. Right? So. Really, really cool. Um, another interesting story about this, we sent all of our proofs over and uh, we got some feedback from the rangers and the Panthera folks in Africa. And they said, hey, Kevin, why are all the maps in English? And I said, because we're in Montana. And they said, well, we speak either Senegalese or French here. I said, well, boy, that would have been something really worth telling us before we finished all the maps. And they said, oh God, we're so sorry. So of course we changed our entry interview paperwork so that we make sure we capture all that data before we take off and start doing it. But we went into overdrive, got a French translator and completely relabeled all the maps and put them into French so they would be useful for the rangers. So that's an important question if you're ever gonna make a map. What language should I use? All right, then we flew back over to Malaysia to, to map for the Tiger Forever sites again. So Kenya uh, Taman Nagara is a beautiful park south of a huge reservoir that you can see there on the screen. And they had a specific zone that they wanted to protect the tigers in so that they could actually come down from forest lands that were north of the park. Um, so there was a very different problem here though. We had a lot of uh, palm oil plantations going in. In fact, the palm oil plantations were coming in faster than we could make our maps. Um, many of them, are totally legal and they're approved by the Malaysian government, but sometimes there's little extra chunks that are cut out that went into the park or into the tiger corridors, right? Um, and the rangers were desperate to have these maps. These guys were out there every single day in the field capturing poachers and they needed a better way to navigate. They're pretty good, they know their landscape really well, but if they could get an edge, we wanted to give it to them. So we started making the maps in the same old way, hand digitizing, we're getting better though, we're doing things faster, we're finding as much data as we can on the web, um, using Google Earth Engine really well to establish the shorelines of the lake. But it is a reservoir, and reservoirs go up and down when they let water out to make electricity, and so we had this shoreline that was ever-changing. And there was also all of these sunken forests that they wanted us to map as well from the satellite imagery, because they would use Zodiac boats to get into the field and get deep into the jungle. So the rangers though did have some data for us like their patrol lines that they had used in the past and camps that they had used. And so we put it all together, put it into the maps and sent them proofs. By the time the proofs were read and they sent them back to us, they said, this plantation has doubled in size. We went back, we got new data. By now we're using planet data with these micro satellites, it's at one meter and we could get a new image once a month. And literally they had doubled the size of the palm plantation since we had mapped it. So our maps are really just a snapshot in time, right? 
On this one, I had a grad student who was my head cartographer. He'd come through all of my classes, and Martin was excellent. He was able to, to really run all the other students. So I was the cartographic director. He was the lead cartographer and the manager of the entire project. He learned a great skill set. He wrote the whole entire thing up as his thesis, including step-by-step -step procedures on how we make these maps. Um, a, a really beautiful bit of work. He's now working in Missoula uh, for a nonprofit doing you know, cartography and, and making maps and loving it. He was super proud when we first did our first print and laid them out on the floor in the, in the lab. An interesting sidelight here, this brand new carpet and new computer desks and all that in the lab here at the UM all came from a donor from a young lady who had worked on a previous project and was happy to tell her grandparents about how much she loved making these maps for tiger conservation. And uh, they were able to put some money together and give us a brand new lab. Pretty fantastic. So this is his total layout of how the whole entire thing works. All the folder structure, he has step-by-step -step instructions for the whole thing. We've shared it with the world. It's free to use, right? And I'll even answer questions about it, no problem. I, I want the maps to be made and the tigers to be protected. This isn't some kind of proprietary thing for us. So we had four good runs. We did a lot of mapping. We were really proud of what we did. But then math reared its ugly head, right? We did a little bit of calculating. Parsa, we did 13 map sheets, right? Manus National Park, we did 12. Neocolo, we did 20. Kenya, we did 24. Add them all up, 69 total map sheets. Ah, I wish we could have got to 70, but that's how it goes sometimes. And it took us about four years to pull it off, 208 weeks. Now we weren't mapping every single week of the year, right? So we had some breaks in the summer, we had some breaks over winter. Uh, we did do some time in between before the, like the funding for a new project would come along. But overall, it was about three weeks per map sheet, right? Well, I take a look at the Tiger Forever sites alone, we're talking about 56,000 square kilometers, needing about 315 map sheets. We're talking about 18 years to complete the project. And I thought, this isn't going to work. I have a date with a sailboat in six years. But I love working with students because my, uh, my grad student, he just said, this is no problem. All we need to do is get this down to one week per map sheet, six years, you're out of here. I was like, exactly, Martin. That's what I'm talking about. So what do we need? We need money. Well, that's not the only thing. It turns out that the maps have become really popular. And the protected places in Africa are now asking for maps, right? So Neocolo wants to finish mapping the entire site for lions. That's 60 map sheets. Lope and Gabon, we gridded it out. That's 45 map sheets. Two parks in Angola need 1,150 map sheets just to cover their parks. That's 1,200 and change map sheets, 72 years. I'm not going to be around for 72 years of mapping. We need something else, right? Plus Mozambique, Kenya, Tanzania, they're all calling. They all want the maps. This is going to make for a lot of sad tigers unless we make a new design, right? So I love the fact that we can make super high-end topographic maps that used to be only the realm of government resources. But they are time-consuming. And maybe we can protect more animals and help more rangers do their job better with a different design. For some places, I'm still going to argue that we need to make the high-end topo maps. But for other places, there might be an alternative. So we had to go all the way back to the beginning, get back to where we started looking at the purpose in the audience. Well, we know our audience is the rangers, right? They're the ones using them. But what was the purpose of the maps? Well, it's to aid field navigation for these anti-poaching patrols. But this is an unconnected environment for the most part. Rarely do they have cell phone service. GPS is spotty, especially when they're in dense jungles. But different landscapes will give us different amounts of connection. Um, and we want to facilitate collection of data on poaching activity. We want them to be able to find where the poachers have been and try and predict where they're going. Um, and we want to help the, danger, the rangers collect data on the animals themselves. So by looking at camera traps, looking at sign in the field, and start to build a body of data that lets us know how many tigers we have in a park, how many lions we have in a park, where they tend to be, so that we can make our patrols the most efficient possible so that they're in between the bad guys and the, the animals that we're trying to protect. So how can we meet these goals faster and cheaper? That's the story of all of our lives, right? Faster and cheaper, faster and cheaper. Well, we're gonna load rugged cell phones, waterproof cell phones, and tablets with the satellite imagery and the relief. 
We can get the satellite imagery. We can get it donated by DigiGlobe and other corporations. They just write it off for their taxes. The relief I can generate pretty quickly and do nice contour work. The thing that takes the longest time is the land cover and all that vector data, right? So we're gonna send the rangers out to collect a lot of that for us. We're gonna use mobile GIS apps for them to collect all of their trails. They can take the points on the houses that they want to be on the maps, right? Why they're out in the field doing their patrols. And then we're gonna integrate with Bluetooth sharing between all the digital devices. So those in the field and the ones in the project manager's hands and then all the way up to the analyst in headquarters and then all the way back to cartographers here at the University of Montana and hopefully soon at John Hopkins University. All right, so this is what it might look like. We've got three different devices. It just so happens that the graphic shows a Mac. Most likely they'll be Android devices, but we'll see whatever works, right? I'm not, I'm not against Macs at all. Um, the Ranger would have one rugged cell phone that they carry with them all the time. It's got MapPT. MapPT is just an app. We might use that one. We might use another one. It allows us to put satellite imagery. It would allow me to put the relief on there. And then Cyber Tracker, which lets us go ahead and take a uh, sign. We take pictures of snares, take pictures of scat. We can grab um, photos from the, uh, from the camera traps and so on, right? Then we've got a manager who has a tablet, a little bit bigger. It's a bigger resource. They have more ability to, to do some analysis. And it might have something like SMART, which is a database for, for wildlife management, right? And then of course the analyst back in the headquarters, they've got everything. They have all the software that the folks in the field have, plus ArcGIS, QGIS, Google Earth, right? CircuitScape. So CircuitScape is what I'm showing on screen here. And the red represents least cost pathways. So you can actually do an analysis of the landscape and say, most likely people will travel along these routes because it's the least resistance in that landscape. And then we can send our rangers there to plant the cameras to see if that's where the poachers are going. The funny thing is humans, when they're hiking through a jungle, they also try to take the path of least resistance and it really works out. So let's see how it would work in the field. Rangers are out on patrol, right? They're keeping tra uh, track of their track of their patrol um, route and they come up to a tree that we know we have a camera on. Already, Panthera has implemented Bluetooth between the cameras and the phones. So they don't need to climb the tree or take a, an SD card out of the camera trap. It instantly sends over, boom, we got a picture of a tiger. Cool, which tiger is it? Well, it turns out we can use AI now to look at the tiger stripes and identify individual animals. Every tiger is unique in its stripe pattern, just like our fingerprint, right? So they go back and see their manager. They give that person all the data. They have the, the path, the tiger picture, but they also have a little bit more, like where the bad guys have been recently, right? And where we've patrolled recently. They can make a decision then. They can send the ranger back in the field to try and do an intervention, or they can take that data up to the analyst. And the analyst has all the data. They know where all the pictures of the tigers have been taken. They know where the bad guys have been camping. They know where the good guys have had camps. And they are able to identify the good guys and the bad guys and the resource that we're trying to protect. And then they can design a patrol that puts the rangers between the poachers and the tigers that they are trying to protect. And then send it back down the chain so the rangers can go in the field. This works great. And this is very close to being completely implemented. Right? But it does take some time. These rangers are going out sometimes for weeks at a time and coming back with this data. What if we didn't have to actually make the data do a big loop and go up the chain to the analyst and then back down to the ranger? What if we could just send the image directly from the tree all the way to the analyst? And what if that camera had a little bit of classification software in it and it could tell us, is it a two-legger or a four-legger? And if it's a two-legger, especially holding a gun, then it would send that image to the analyst through a, a network of satellites, and then we would be able to instantly put that data into the main database, analyze it, and then design a program that will help us get out into the field faster and stop the poachers. This would be real-time anti-poaching um, interfaces. This is the ultimate goal, right? But what's the problem? Well, Sending things by satellite, you know, texting an image takes quite a bit of power. So the camera needs a power source. It needs an antenna. So we're going to have to be up in the trees, most likely, putting solar panels, putting antennas up there. Um, they already have prototypes of the software that can classify. So we can save some power if it only sends an image to us when we think it's a bad guy, or if it only sends an image to us when we think it's a four-legger like a tiger. And we might get to the place where the tree camera trap actually can classify the images and even tell us what tiger it is 
by their unique identifying stripes, which then are an attribute in a table, right? And then tell the analyst, we found tiger number 007, James Bond, right? Okay. So here's some good news, you guys. We mapped Parso, we finished it in uh, 20, end of 2015, they got the maps in 2016. There has been a 19% increase of tigers in Nepal with the last four years, right? Um, in Parsa, a wildlife reserve, we've had tiger cubs um, show up on camera traps for the first time in decades. And I wanna show them to you now. There's no sound with this video, and it's just screenshots coming from one of our camera traps. But look at these little fellas here in the park. Isn't that fantastic? The maps work. The maps are part of a system and the system works and we're proud to be part of that system, but it really takes the folks in the field to do it and put these camera traps out there and patrol the park. And watch, you'll see two of the little fellas here, right there, two tiger cubs, right? This is fantastic news. This is huge. This has changed the game, right? We've managed to stop the poaching in a park that had the habitat, had the prey, but didn't have the tigers simply because there was people that were abusing it. And with a little bit of protection and some resources in the edge of really good cartography, they were able to turn it around in only four years. It's incredible. So worldwide in Asia specifically, we've seen a huge increase. When I first started the program in uh, 2014, the estimates were for about 3,200 tigers alive wild in, um, in the world. Now we're up at 38, 3,900. And this was from 2016. They were going to do another global survey, supposed to come out in the spring of 2020, but COVID came around. So we've had a hard time getting some data. We're pretty confident, though, that we're over 4,000 now, right? So this is a huge success story. I'd like to think it's all the maps, but I know we're just part of the equation. We're super proud of it, though. All right. So we've also had good results in Manus. Um, just uh, seven years ago, there were no tigers to speak of in Manus. And this was from the um, New York Times just a couple of springs ago. Um, but now there are more than 30 tigers in Manus, right? And we started seeing it in the Indian Times up 50% in just last three years. And this is simply because rangers are stopping the poachers from taking the animals illegally. There is a ton of tigers up in Bhutan. Bhutan has really good protection. And when those tigers come across the border, they are now allowed to live in peace inside of Manus National Park and start to breed. And we have the evidence of that with kittens also on the camera traps inside of Manus, right? So Fred, the president of Panthera now, says, as the results in Manus show, a focused effort in locking these key tiger sites can increase tiger populations. We can do this. We are doing this. And we, we can't afford to stop now, right? So what about Kenya? Well, Dr. Rob Pickles, who has been working in the field in Kenya, tells us why every tiger counts. This is a story about a tigress who we know was first detected in 2012 as a cub in one park where there's very good protection. We've now re-detected her approximately 120 kilometers to the south in another park. And so she's traveled an enormous great distance through a mixture of parks and habitats we believe that she's now setting up a territory. It's a very large park, it's about 800 kilometers squared, and so far she is the only tiger that we know is there, despite the fact that the prey is there, the security is there. So now it's really just this burgeoning potential for reseeding an entire population, and we believe that's possible. We can't pause now, we have to shore up the connection between where she came from and where she is now. Protecting those, those sites is, is really the crucial um, element of the work. There are actually a lot of very skilled hunters in the area. There are people who hunt with dogs, with homemade guns, with snares and with other different types of trap as well. And we are trying to combat these threats. We have to in order to make that link a regular highway for tigers. We can have tigers coming back and forth and, 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 and perhaps even breeding in between. The heroes in this story are really the rangers, um, the patrollers who go out day in, day out in some extremely inhospitable terrains through dense forest. It's really not an easy job at all to be searching for poachers and hunters. 
We know the security situation there has improved and the guys are doing their utmost to protect her, but we need to get her a mate. Everything will be in vain if there isn't a second tiger, a male tiger, that comes down and can breed with her. Every tiger does count. We don't have many left. There's 3,900 estimated in the wild, so with that few number and those scattered across multiple different fragments of forest, it's really true that every, every tiger counts. Fantastic, huh? It's working. The system does work, and we need to keep pushing and keep going towards bringing together these different innovative maps and apps uh, for our future work and try and cover and protect as many of these big cats as we can. So what we're looking to do is create a satellite uplink for the camera traps, like I was talking about before. We'll have to figure out how to power them and how to get an antenna maybe to the top of a tree real-time threat analysis and ranger dispatch. So we can have this one-way loop so that we get the data to the analyst and they just send it down the pipe really quick and we could maybe even dispatch rangers real-time when we see a poacher in the field and have them you know, cross their path and hopefully arrest them. Um, a global database of satellite imagery for use by Panthera and that's just a matter of going out and collecting it so that we can put it onto their, um, their tablets and their phones um, and th there's some uh, manipulation that has to be done so that it can fit and so forth, but right now each individual site is just downloading it on their own, and that takes a lot of time for them to manage that, and we can do better. Um, and then artificial intelligence for data creation. There's been some huge advances. Just recently, uh, AI for Earth um, for Microsoft has, has been able to map all the buildings in the United States of America from satellite imagery. So imagine if we could do that for South Asia, we wouldn't need to click on every single building. We could get the building footprint from, uh, you know, from basically machine learning. And so we're working with different partners to try and make that a reality. If they could pull streets, if they could pull streams, if they could pull all of the vector data out, we wouldn't need to hand digitize it. It would increase the speed of the maps and lower the cost. And then a wiki range map crowdsource again. So if we do have to make the data, why do I have to have just the students here at UM make them? Why don't I get students in universities all around the country making it? Why don't we turn it into a, uh, an exercise for high school students or junior high students where they go in and just spend one afternoon in a uh, like uh, open street map type of platform and digitizing features over the top of some satellite imagery. You know, the more data we can get, the more maps we can make, right? And ultimately, my ultimate goal is a UM Center for Conservation Cartography and GIS. So at the University of Montana centers require funding. And once we get that happening, we're gonna do it. And then we will have poll to bring in more grants from all over the place and share the wealth too, and bring in students from other universities and just try to flood the zone with beautiful maps with a very specific pur purpose, which is to save these big cats. So I'd like to make some acknowledgements. Um, I couldn't do what I do without everybody who supports me. Um, especially all of my friends, my colleagues, my wife, Anatina. I just want to thank you all. I want to thank the University of Montana. Um, I want to thank Panthera. They're really the driving force in this. And Dr. Hugh Robinson, who directs their um, science support lab. Dr. Than Robinson, who's one of their GIS and cartography professionals. And then, of course, all of my great, talented, and committed students that make these projects possible. I couldn't do any of this on my own. And without them, it just wouldn't happen. So thanks to all them. Thank you for listening. A little hint, we are starting to map territory for snow leopards in Bhutan. We've now moved to a possible product to map leopard territory in the mountains in Western Saudi Arabia. And all we're waiting for is this COVID thing to get wrapped up so we can get back into the field and, um, and keep doing good work that's making a big difference in the world. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll stick around for questions. Oh my gosh, Kevin, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that was just so inspirational. And I know there's been a lot of great questions in the um, chat room. So I'm gonna go ahead and put up the uh, questions, comments, thoughts. Um, for folks that would like to ask a question, I would encourage you to unmute yourself, uh, speak to Kevin. Uh, it's one of those great opportunities where we get to network as a group. Um, so I will turn the floor open to those that have questions. Hi, Kevin. Um, my name is David. Thank you very much for having this presentation. It was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the uh, use of cartography and if you could talk a little bit more about its importance in this project. 
Well, so we've all probably heard the rumors that paper maps are going away, right? That it's just going to be a digital cartography world. And I'm here to tell everyone that that simply is not the case. Uh, paper maps are going to have a niche to fill for a long time. Um, as I said in the presentation, there are landscapes, and particularly these landscapes where the rangers are having to do patrols, where they're unconnected much of the day. They don't have any GPS coverage. They don't have any cell phone coverage. Um, and so the only way for them to navigate is to either have spent an entire lifetime in that particular forest to know it like the back of their hand, which we do have some rangers that fit that bill, and that's great. But many of the rangers are ex-military or so from that government, from that country, and they might have not spent much time in these forests. And so for them to have an advantage uh, against poachers who maybe be led by a local who has you know, first-hand knowledge of the forest, they really need paper maps in their hands to navigate by. And with that cartographic product, that gives them so much information in a condensed, well-designed space, they're able to get ahead of the poaching teams. So they know the elevation, they know where the river drainages are, they know where roads are, they know where uh, there are um, uh, different types of landscape so they can see the land cover and say, let's get out of this dense jungle, move into a nice wide riverbed, move up and then come back in on a ridge and cut off a poaching gang or something like that. So it really does give them an edge and an ability to do things that, that uh, just a, a very small map on a small screen would not be able to, to be used for the same purpose. Yeah, uh, you mentioned a, a project with your grad students um, and that a lot of that data was available. Where can those of us that are interested access it? Well, it depends on, it depends on the source um, and it depends on which area of the world. So Malaysia had pretty good GIS data uh, Nepal had almost no GIS data. India has good data, but doesn't share it with the world. So it just depends where you're going. Um, no matter what, whenever we start a project, we do a, just a scouring of all possible data sources and try to get a hold of it. And if we can't, then we know that we have to make it ourselves. Because we were partnering with the Malaysian government and they had a good partnership with Panthera, they were forthcoming with some data. But we still had to create the land cover and the lake boundaries and you know, yeah. get some data from the rangers and put it all together. Satellite imagery is available for folks out there. You guys as students. Oh, yeah, step by step. Mm -hmm. Well, you can get, you can get satellite imagery. Um, you know, the, the Sentinel data is 30 meter or 10 meter, excuse me. And that's free to the world. You can get that through Google Earth Engine or you can download it from their site. Uh, you can get the Landsat data, but that's kind of a coarse resolution. That's free. Um, with an academic account and Planet Satellite Labs, you can get data from them. You just have to apply and get an academic account. And that will be um, one meter data that's, that's once a month, right? Sometimes it's got cloud coverage and stuff, so you gotta just dig through it. Um, so there's lots of data sources. For our maps, for the shaded relief, we're using STRM data that has been resampled to 30 meters. We would like to do even better. We would like to get 10 meter data. So we're really hopeful that the new LIDAR that has been installed on the International Space Station is gonna bear fruit really soon and give us 10 meter DEMs of the entire world. And that would be fantastic. When we map in the United States, we're used to that kind of resolution, but we don't have that coverage everywhere in the world. And then for other things like uh, land cover, we use Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine allows us to run uh, image classification over large areas just using code. We don't have to download the satellite imagery. Google stores it all in the cloud for us. But you do have to learn a bit of JavaScript and, and learn how to do some coding. But it's an incredibly powerful tool that's free to the world. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So somebody has asked if I'm interested in training students in these countries. Absolutely. We've worked with some partners in India. We did work with a team. They weren't students. They were actually GIS professionals in a lab. Um, it can be tricky, though. It can be tricky. The, I can get the kind of quality that I want out of my students because I can, I can be a helicopter cartography instructor. I can hover over their shoulders and always be checking the data quality. Sometimes we get things from partners overseas and they're doing the very best they can and they've done great work, but it's not at the resolution that we need. So um, all these things I think can evolve over time and we can really try to get more and more people involved uh, around the world. Uh, I have nothing against trying to spread the GIS knowledge far and wide. I think that's a great strategy for us going forward.
Kevin, I have a question for you. Um, have you thought about pushing the digitized data back out to OpenStreetMap um, once you guys you know, we, we haven't yet, and there, there was some security con concerns. So Panthera was concerned that, that not only the data, but the finished maps not get out and end up in the hands of the poaching teams. You could, you could imagine how it would be a tragedy if they were uh, to, to get a, a set of the maps. Um, in this world, most likely they might someday get through that way, but that's why we're hoping that there'll be constant ground truthing and updating. And so the maps that the Rangers have are always the very best. Um, so we haven't pushed through the hand digitized data. That's a product that Panthera, you know, bought and paid for, and they, they'd like to keep it in house for now, but they certainly are sharing it with their, their partners in country. So the GIS technicians in India and Nepal and Malaysia, they all have full copies but it's not been made public for those reasons that I mentioned. Interesting. Anyone else like to ask their question to Kevin? There's a couple of Kevin being posted in the chat. So I don't know if you want to look at them. Let's see. I did ask the first one about pushing the data back out. Um, I guess I'll ask another question before I turn it over to the students again. Um, you know, in using OpenStreetMap, you were talking about, you know, getting students involved and in an hour a day digitizing buildings. Um, you know, for the disaster response side of things, you know, OpenStreetMap has a really good workflow on having volunteers jump in uh, and they digitize rooftops. Same thing what you're doing, um, very similar. So I'd be interesting to compare the two and, you know, in, in setting up how that looks. Yeah, I, I'm looking for a partner to help me through with OpenStreetMap, Cassie, hint, hint. Um, my, I've used some OpenStreetMap data and unfortunately it's not easy to get clean data out of OSM and into ArcGIS, but we, there are ways to do everything, right? So I found a workflow and a workaround for every problem I've ever run into in the GIS world. So it's just a matter of time of, uh, of taking the time, just a matter of getting into it and figuring it out. Um, but I've been slammed trying to make maps and trying to teach classes and uh, I am open to getting help on these projects for sure. Okay, we'll connect after. Sounds good. So somebody asked in the chat, why did we choose Parsa as our first park? Well, the Panthera makes the choice, but it's, it's based on a number of things. There might've been parks that were, were better suited, but maybe they didn't have a ranger crew already in place that was ready to go into the field, didn't have a source population right next door, didn't have the poaching pressure that they were seeing. And also, it, you have to make relationships with the, with the foreign governments. You can't just show up and say, we're going to save the tigers here. We go to them and say, we have this whole program, and we would love to work with you. What is your um, you know, most urgent need? And so the local uh, foreign government really needs buy-in. If they don't feel like the, they're the ones that are, are running the show, then, then it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a bad you know, feeling uh, for them, and, and, and it doesn't work for us either. The last thing we want is them to feel like we're coming in to save them. We're offering services and resources that they could utilize in whatever way they feel is best. Regarding changes in technology, what are you guys doing to combat that? If, you know, changes, this is a question in the chat window. It constantly is changing. I know that my workflow out of ArcGIS into Illustrator is going to go away when they when they totally sunset Arc Desktop, right? So Arc Pro is the new thing. We're all slowly moving into it. Um, I'm starting to teach in it, but they don't have a clean export to AI, Adobe Illustrator out of there yet. They have their new thing, which is a .AIX export out of Pro and then a plugin that was made for Illustrator. I've used it. It still has some bugs to be worked out, but it's going to get there and it will be the way forward. But that's gonna mean another grad student completely rewriting the entire program on how we make these maps. And it's gonna be an ever evolving, you know, uh, collaboration between myself, students, software companies. And it's always been that way. If you go back just 30 years ago, we were still tracing maps out on Mylar, right? On plastic sheets and then overlaying them and taking a big picture with a giant negative camera. So those days are over, but new challenges exist and they crop up all the time. Uh, somebody's asking if there's tutorials for incorporating Adobe Illustrator and cartography. Yep, uh, with COVID, I've had to move my classes online. And so my entire advanced cartographic design course is at my YouTube channel. I've been doing videos of both the labs and of some of my lectures. 
and that's at Matt Practical, all one word on YouTube. You can't miss it. Like it, subscribe to it, make me famous. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, I really share a lot. I also do all of my um, intro labs are up. I need to make another lab tomorrow morning before the students uh, come in. And um, I've also last semester when COVID hit right after spring break, the second half of my intermediate GIS class, which is in ARC Pro, is up on Moodle. And next spring, I will finish the first half creating all those videos. Well, I want to be aware of everyone's time. I know it's, you know, dinner time for folks around the country and around the world. And, um, but I just wanted to thank Kevin. Thank you so much for speaking to us. This was, again, so exciting. You're doing amazing work. And um, let's keep chatting about collaboration because I, I want to get our, our students involved. Yes, you thank you, everybody. I see there's more questions about automation and stuff. We're looking at everything. We've tried, we've tried automation and haven't got the resolution that we need. We're making maps at a resolution that's just not common. You know, we can get open street map streets, but does it show every trail that connects villages in the middle of a jungle? No. And the human eye is really the only thing that can do that yet. All right. But I'm, I'm confident AI is going to get there, but not quite there yet. All right. All right. Well, I do want to um, let everyone know that we are having a second part to GIS After Dark. Um, we're going to be hearing from a panel of JHU alumni. And so I welcome you guys to register and join. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of everyone's busy day. Kevin, thank you for being here. And Kevin, you and I will be in touch. Great. Thanks a lot, everybody. Go out there and make beautiful maps. Appreciate <laughs> it. Have a good night. Take, Take care, care, guys. Thank you.